Hey, everybody. It is uh, your host of Real Top Bluegrass, 11th episode, and what a night it's going to be with two amazing bluegrass singer, performers, songwriters. It's Songwriters of the Year from the International Bluegrass Music Association. Donna Ulisi and Jerry Sally joining us tonight. So welcome to the show, everybody. How are you two? Doing good. Doing good. <laughs> so this is fun. <laughs> this is awesome to have both of you guys um, being part of the show tonight because 11th episode, going into the holidays, want to talk songwriting, talking about producing, and talking about your own music, which has been definitely making the charts these last few months during this crazy pandemic of a year that we've had. And um, first and foremost, once again, congratulations on both of you guys' awards with the International Bluegrass Music Association. Donna, of course, 2016 Songwriter of the Year. Jerry Sally, back to back 2018-2019 Songwriter of the Year. And oh, that. <laughs> Over <to> you, exactly. <laughs> and of course, Donna, you won um, 2017 IBMA Song of the Year for writing I Am a Drifter with uh, Mark Rossi. Yeah. And as well as 2017 was another great year with uh, Songwriter of the Year with Spigma. So congratulations to both of you again. Um, so how have you guys been doing? Jerry, you know, Let's start with you. This is a crazy year, and but you've been staying busy with uh, your own music as well as Billy Blue Records. Yeah. How has this kind of um, kind of changed how you guys kind of promote your music? You as a, so, so, a solo artist as well as the artist you work with with Billy Blue Records, who happens to also have Donna Ulysse on the label. That's right. Um, well, it's been challenging to say the least. Um, um, we we haven't really changed much of the way we're doing business. We're just trying to get um, as much music out there as we can to radio. And thank goodness to folks like you, Michelle, that we love and appreciate so much. Because um, without your help, you know, we couldn't keep this thing going with all the shutdowns that are going on. Um, it's it's really hurt the bands the most um, because they just you know that's how they make their living. And so it's been uh, it's been a very challenging year for them. But as far as the label goes, we're just trying to do what we can. Uh, Alan Bybee's finishing his album up right now as I speak, and we'll be getting it out in January. But we're hoping and praying that by the first of the year, people will be able to you know, get out and, and be a little bit normal. Um, I, I just got back from Florida. I did a songwriters festival down in a five-day festival um, at the Frank Brown Songwriters Festival and just got home Monday night. So that was a, a fun time. Um, a lot of people there. Um, it was just... It was, it was it was good insane i guess you could say because it was insane all right but it was fun and it was good and uh if aaron and i don't go, don't don't get sick from that festival then we must be immune that's all i gotta say <laughs> <laughs> now donna of course you also have an album um that's just recently been out on billy blue records and obviously this this year like for everybody, it's been difficult, but how has this uh, kind of changed things on how you guys are promoting uh, the new album? You know, um, it, it, there's just no other way to say it. It was a God thing that my album dropped when it did. Um, and uh, it's just been a blessing because, you know, it's it's tough. We've watched all of our shows disappear off of our scheduling. And um, Jerry and I also do these wonderful songwriting workshops with my husband, Rick Stanley, and we had to cancel all of that. So um, I'm just so thankful to radio for supporting this new record. It came out in the nick of time and, um, I, and I'm just blessed. Uh, on top of COVID, which, you know, locked us down and, um, and froze us in place around March, I was hit by a tornado in May. Mm -hmm. And um, I always say with everything, with every opportunity lost through this COVID thing, there's been opportunities gained. But because I was home and able to sort of tend the farm, we rebuilt and um, have really added a lot for the Little House workshops here on the Little Wee Farm. And um, that wouldn't have happened, I guess, if it hadn't been for COVID oh, and the tornado. Right. I, you know, one of the key things is a lot of folks that I've been talking to, you know, either here on Real Talk or on the Bluegrass Borderline and the Smoke Country Jam, 
um, they have said, you know, they've either came to more appreciation of what they do on the road and their songwriting skills have kind of, you know, just developed even more so because they've had more time. And, you know, like you mentioned, the Little House uh, Songwriting Workshop, that is, you know, an amazing uh a venture that you guys have started and how long have you guys actually been doing that donna what is that jerry has it been like four this, years this, now this, no this would have been our third year third um, okay yeah, this He's would have been our third year had we been able to you know keep it going yeah but, we uh, were sold out for the whole year already we, we were we it, it was devastating uh not just from a financial thing but but we really love and enjoy these things yeah and, and it's just a great weekend it's always fun um uh, we and actually we can talk about this more later but we have had several songs that we've written at the little house short shop not only be recorded but be hits by some of the bluegrass artists so it's uh it's it's really developed into something really special that we enjoy and we have really missed it this year i love to describe it like this um you know these these virtual strangers show up at our back door you know jerry gets over here and rick and i and jerry get to kind of have a cup of coffee and get ready for the people that show up at 10 o'clock on saturday morning and they come in honestly with a guitar or whatever they ride on and a dream to get their song to the next level so what a complete joy it is for for me and for jerry and for rick is to help these people get their song in a place that they dreamed of. It's yeah. it's a, mm -hmm. a joyful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, you're helping people reach their dreams by reaching your dreams. Um, the two of you have had two successful careers, not only in bluegrass, but country music as well. Jerry, you're from Chillicothe, Ohio. Go Buckeyes. Go Buckeyes. Um, <laughs> and, and you came to Nashville in 1982. Um, I know me and you have talked numerous times about, you know, your, your adventure, you know, your beginning of your life in 1982, moving to Nashville. How has that differ? Obviously with looking back and looking back, those 500 plus songs that you've written for numerous artists from Reba McIntyre to the slew of bluegrass artists to Elton John, how has that really shaped what you continue to do and influence and mentor others to do? Well, um, everything seems to kind of work hand in hand as, as you go through life. It seems like one opportunity leads to another. Um, I have had a very uh, blessed life in country music as a songwriter, uh, having had all those hits with the blue, with the country artists and all. And um, I was raised, though, on bluegrass, as you well know. Uh, uh, Dad played banjo, five string. He was a huge uh, Earl Scruggs, Flatten Scruggs fan. And um, so that's really where I got my love in bluegrass and, uh, and traditional country music. He was a huge, you know, traditional George Jones, Merle Haggard, people like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so as I journeyed through town, you know, I came to town, I was able to get some songs recorded in the country world. And uh, to be totally frank with you, I mean, we all, we're all three in bluegrass, right? We know we can make a, a living in bluegrass, but you don't make the living you make as uh, George Strait or an Alan Jackson or people like that. And I'll be totally honest, the blessings that I received as a country writer early on in my career and uh, even as recently as the Chris Stapleton stuff about four years ago, I mean, it's allowed me to have the ability to, to really dive more into my bluegrass and my roots where I really want to live musically. Mm -hmm. So it's really it's really enabled me financially to to do what I love the most uh, at this time in my life. If that makes sense. Yeah, now, Donna, your your career pretty much uh, started back in 1991 with a record deal in country music, and and, and you kind of veered into bluegrass. How how has that um, for a Virginia girl from you know Hampton, Virginia, kind of formed to what you do now? And I, again, to go forward and mentor the young and older who want to learn more. Um. It's been a wild ride, and I, it's it's funny that uh, Jerry and Aaron we we shared a, a meal with them last night, Rick and I, and we were talking. the The strangest part is that Jerry's journey and my journey were very parallel on Music Row in Nashville, mm -hmm. um, and the 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 fact that we didn't really get to know each other then, and now we're like brother and sister in this world, 
And yeah. I think he morphed the same way that I morphed into this. Uh, I'm married into bluegrass. Um, I married Rick Stanley and he is one of those Stanleys. And my father-in-law's biggest dream always was to hear me sing bluegrass music. But by that time I was sort of entrenched in the, in the music row scene. And um, I don't know, it took me becoming a songwriter to find my voice in bluegrass music. I started mm -hmm. writing when Rick would take me up to the mountains in, in the Clinch Mountains of Virginia and sitting on that front porch because there's nothing to do. There's no television. They do have a radio, an AM radio. And um, so there's nothing to do but sit on that porch and, and dream. And uh, that really, that really carved the path for me to get into this genre. And I couldn't be happier. This is where I was always supposed to be. It took me a little bit. I'm glad I'm here now. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, you know, of course, when you, you look at it and you think about like what you both have done um, as individuals and together, because um, you've co-written so many wonderful songs that has, have been released and have been hits and, uh, and that it kind of makes you appreciate more of where you fell in love. You know, you fell back in love with something, Jerry, with bluegrass and Donna, you fell into love with not only a, a bluegrass man, but the bluegrass music as well. And you're embracing it and bringing it together. And, you know, that kind of brings the, the question of um, these days, um, bluegrass music today and how different it is. Um, you know, Jerry, you, me and you, we saw each other back in March during my time with Leadership Bluegrass. And th this was a topic that was huge and hot and heavy um, during the discussion of us there is yeah. the different uh, sub genres of bluegrass music. Yeah. And how, how does how can, how can one as a songwriter, you know, define, you know, obviously who you want to reach as an artist to record your music, as um, if they're a progressive artist or a traditional artist or a contemporary artist in bluegrass. How, do, how does that work for a songwriter uh, from a songwriter's aspect? Jerry, we'll go with you first. Well, to be totally honest with you, um, and, I, and I'm a huge, um, I, I, I really revere the traditional bluegrass that I was raised on, and I will always uh, love that. But there's a lot of progressive stuff that I sincerely love and uh, I just uh, I embrace it and I think we all need to embrace it um, you know we're, life nothing stays the same ever you know and uh, what I don't want to do is lose those those intricate traditional um, uh, pieces of bluegrass I don't want to ever lose that totally so I think it's real important as we as we grow the the music and as it changes and as it becomes more progressive, I don't think, you know, I don't want to get to something that we just don't recognize as bluegrass, if that makes any sense. But there is so much uh, progressive stuff that really almost lives, uh, lives more in the Americana world, let's say, uh, more acoustic music in the Americana world than it is bluegrass. But having said that, um, I think it's really important that we embrace these new groups and the new music and, and just, we have to evaluate each project and each group as they're released really. And, and, uh, and just hope that they are maintaining in a, a, a reverent way uh, that where their music came from. And as a writer, I try to write all of it. Um, I still write country songs. I still write a lot of gospel songs, but bluegrass is where I live and where I write probably 80% of my songs these days, but I don't write just traditional bluegrass. I write, a little bit more on the countryside of bluegrass. I write some progressive with a lot of different kind of chords and, and chord, chord progressions and stuff like that. So from a songwriting standpoint, I think it's important for me to listen to everything and stay in tune with everything and know what's going on in order to get my songs recorded. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, always a key thing. And even as a broadcaster, you know, all different bluegrass shows are different. Some fall just strictly in the traditional contemporary or, you know, my show, it, it's a widespread of all of it. So I mix it all in together. Hence right. the borderline part of the, the name of the show. Now, Donna, how about for you? I mean, that in your aspects of writing and kind of, you know, reaching the fans as well as the artists that you want to reach with your music. I err on this. I, I was, I was gonna, um, 
interrupt Jerry, but I'm trying really hard not to. But <laughs> the truth is, I think Jerry will admit the same thing. I don't think I ever sit down to write a certain kind of music. I think mm -hmm. it's sort of organic for both of us. I think um, a song's going to be what a song wants to be. If you honor, you know, well, it's, it's my approach to it anyway. I just sort of follow the song. Um, if I want a more traditional bluegrass song, I bring it to the Clinch Mountain, which is my husband. You, you know, I'll, I'll bring a partial song or an idea that I've got, and I'll know that it needs to be, you know, more traditional. And, you know, Rick adds that for me. And we're, we're great writing partners. Um, you know, we work around the stove. <laughs> we have something going on the stove and he'll say, hold on, let me, let me go put this on. And then he'll come back. And uh, when he leaves the room, he comes back. Oh yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. When I write with Jerry, um, a lot of times we'll know somebody's looking for something and we'll write, you know, specifically for that. Um, I, I just, I just write what I feel. And if you stick with writing what's honest and you, you make somebody feel something yeah. and, and you, I just, that's, that's the way that I approach all of my songs. And the miracle is that they adapt very well uh, in this genre that, that um, you know, somebody like a Doyle Lawson gets behind the arrangement and, mm -hmm. um, and I have a good album and, or hopefully I pitch them mm -hmm. to people that have good albums with them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and this kind of goes leads into you a little bit about the, uh, you know, the Little House Songwriter Workshop, because I've, I've spoken to people who have participated in the workshop and and the way they've kind of described how you guys do it is like you ask them like some ideas, some things that they want to touch base on. And how do you how do you do that? I mean, you take from what what they want to experience and want to share. And how do you create a song over pretty much a weekend? Who's first? I'll go with you, Donna. Okay. You know, I I love it because um, I feel like they have a certain idea of how it's going to go, and it goes completely opposite of what they come here expecting. And it's a miracle every time. I never, I don't have an answer for that because what I, I what I do here's how we run the workshop. It's sort of like speed dating. So uh, Jerry will be in one classroom. And because Rick and I do the cooking, uh, Rick and I teach together and we're in our own classroom. So uh, for three hours, we split the four students. Two will write with Jerry and two will write with Rick and I for three hours uh, or about that time. And mm -hmm. then we have lunch and we switch classrooms. So the two students get to write with both classes. And I just start out by asking them, you know, what's on their heart. We usually just start talking. Um, Rick will strum the guitar or I'll strum the guitar. And it just, it's so organic. I, and I try not to get in the way. I try let the, tr I, I really do try to let them participate as much as they feel comfortable with doing. Now, if we get hung up, I'll take over and say, hey, we should try it in this direction or let's, let's try this. But um, both of us have had a lot of success doing it. Uh, you know, Jerry's had a lot of cuts from from his classes. Rick and I right now um, have something on my album that I just think is a dandy. It's called From the, the Heart of Rosine. And uh, that was written here at the Little House. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's a mystery how it happens. Yeah. Maybe Jerry has a better answer. <laughs> uh, I don't have a better answer, but it's it's organic and, and it's it is organic that's a great word um the uh they they come there with such they just don't know what to expect when they get there they don't and and there's really no way we can try to tell them all day long what it's going to be like but until they experience it they don't know and by the end of the first day you know when we we'll get through with writing with the first set and then what we do michelle is we have a big dinner we have lunch together on Saturday after our little uh, uh, schoolroom kind of uh, presentation that we do. Then we start writing all afternoon. Later that evening, we all have a big supper together and we have a picking party. And then on Sunday morning, we switch up and we, like the two that wrote with me will write with Don and Rick and the two that wrote with him will write with me on Sunday. But by the end of the weekend, uh, I can proudly say, and Donna can affirm, affirm this, um, 
I can't count the times that people will say at the end of the weekend, wow, this was so great. This was so cool. This was so much more than I expected because they just don't know what to expect. Right. And our dream, our, our goal, our prayer is that they will learn and take this information that they've, that they've learned, you know, at the workshop and take it home and, and, and make their songs better and think harder and to dig deeper uh, for that, right line or that right word. One word can change an entire song. And so um, uh, it's just been incredible. I know um, we, like Donna said, we've had several songs recorded from the workshop um, uh, from bacon and my beans, which was a big hit for Joe Mullins to, to Donna's current next single. So it's just been a, a blessing and uh, we can't guarantee that's going to happen every time. Um, but we certainly do our best to write the best songs we can while they're here because the, the bottom line is uh, there's the Sal family right now that came in for one weekend. Um, we, uh, um, our, our goal is to write the best song that we can while they're here. But, but beyond that is to teach and for them to learn, you know, even if we don't write the, the big hit, that they will at least um, um, be able to take something home with them that, that's valuable. And, you know, Jerry, right, I, I know, I know Jerry would agree with me on one thing. I learn as much from them as, as we hope they learn yeah, from us absolutely. every time. It's just a, it's a wonderful experience for everyone involved, not, not just the attendees, but for us too. Yeah. Well, and, and it seems like you don't just bring in um, or attract up and coming aspiring songwriters or artists. You you also have folks who've been in the business for years, kind of wanted to kind of retweak their style of writing and yeah. probably meet others so they could write with other people than what they normally write. Correct? Yeah. Yes. I think that's true. I think I think a lot of people, um, I, and 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 Donna can can confirm this too everybody has their own little different way of approaching songwriting, everybody. And um, I think a lot of them just want to come and try to learn. And, and cause all we can teach is how we do it. You know, there are other ways to spin the cat, so to speak. And so I think a lot of these folks, even the folks who have had success or have, have been writers or taken a break and want to get back into it. I think they, they come just for the relationship and the camaraderie and to learn how the two of us, cause we've been, you know, we've been very blessed and we don't take that lightly. Right. And, but it's because we have our own approach, a certain way we approach songwriting. And a lot of folks that come here, they might know how to write a song or the basics of how to put a song together, but they don't necessarily know how to write a commercial song. And the only way to make a living as a songwriter, the way we have is to write songs that are commercial, that are radio ready, that and that's what we really try yep. to instill with them. If they really want to do this and they want to hear their song on the radio, they have to approach it from a commercial standpoint. And and uh, it's okay to write a personal song. And yeah, it's, of course it is. We all write personal songs all the time, but those are not necessarily the ones. The ones that get too personal aren't necessarily the ones that are going to get played on the radio. So we we, we stress that and and uh, it's just it's we. We have been blessed by this. We really have. And, and, and the I'm glad you brought up the commercial thing because I think that's the hardest part to teach a new writer mm -hmm. is that um, yeah. if you want to see it, you know, go breathe out, you know, on the airways, you have to find a way to connect with the larger audience. Yeah. And so it can't be so the, the information in the song can't be so inside that you don't connect with a mass of people. And that is, um, our strength as um, songwriting teachers is we do teach commercial songwriting. One thing, um, and obviously, uh, you know, folks know that, you know, you're songwriters, you know, first and foremost, you're artists, uh, performers, but you're also producers. Both of you have produced several artists in the business. And uh, Jerry, I, I, congratulations, finding out last night, um, nominated for a producer uh, with Christy Cox album, No Headlights for the Country Music Association of Australia. Yeah. Um, that is, you know, I know you've been nominated as a producer for a Grammy, um, <clears throat> as well as um, being nominated for uh, Nashville Songwriter Hall of Fame. I mean, that this is these are things that, I mean, I'm sure you never thought, as a child, you're going to be reaching these, you know, milestones and these highlights of your career. But 
get in that knob last night for uh, <clears throat> the uh, CMAA. Um, how does that make you feel, to, you know, as a producer? And I know on that album, you also have several cuts that you both have wrote on um, mm -hmm. and have a little piece of uh, no headlights as well. Yeah. Jerry. Well, um, you know, I've, I've loved producing. I've been producing now for about 12, 13 years. I was very blessed to, uh, the first Balsam Range album I was able to produce and the, the first two Brent, Darren and Brooke albums I was able to produce. And um, it, I, being in the studio, creating something from just, you know, you, you got this song that's just you and a guitar and turning it into a record and creating something is just very exciting to me and something that I have really grown to love and I love doing more and more of it. Um, uh, I'm really excited about the uh, nomination last last night the, the Country Music Awards in uh, the CMA of Australia, for instance, um, they're a little bit different than our CMA in a very, very, very wonderful way. And that is they recognize bluegrass and traditional country. So uh, they, re they with several years ago, they added a, um, uh, a category, Bluegrass Recording of the Year, and Christy has won that four times, I think four out of the five years that they've had it. And I was very blessed to produce those records and co-wrote two, three of the four, I think. But um, this is the first time that I have been genuinely, I guess, officially nominated as a producer because mm -hmm. they have a category for traditional country album of the year. And she, her, not, her album is nominated for that. And uh, I just feel really blessed. And, and I have so many wonderful friends. Uh, I co-write with a lot of, of country artists over there because they do a lot of still traditional country stuff over there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was just a real honor and a surprise, to be honest with you, to see my name on there. Um, there were years ago that they didn't allow uh, out, people outside of Australia to be nominated. Like if you were a producer um, years ago and you were not an Australian producer, the album could be nominated, but the producer would not necessarily be nominated um, officially. As wow. uh, So... Uh, they've changed those rules, and I'm really grateful for that. And uh, I, I can show you, they're, they're called Golden Guitars. And this is what they look like right here, because I have, uh, they, they gave me, they gave me, uh, when, 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 uh, when uh, well, they're, they're pretty, they're very cool. They're unique and they're awesome, actually. So anyway, I don't know if we'll win another one, but I'm, it's such an honor to be, to be nominated in that. And then they're going to sing, going to shout thing, going out to the Grammys. Uh, Aaron and I went out there this past February before COVID hit. And thank goodness that happened before all this, because we had an incredible experience. Um, obviously, we didn't win, but uh, Michael won, who deserved that. I mean, that was a, that's a great album, and he's a great artist. But it was just such a wonderful opportunity to uh, to get to – experience that you know mm -hmm. and uh, and i've been in the studio i'm producing a project that um, it's called country faith bluegrass and i was able to produce a cut on um, dolly parton which was an incredible honor and so we got dolly and, and darren and brooke and uh, uh oh gosh who else we got on there we got a lot of wonderful folks on there so that'll come out next year and i was great grateful to be a part of that as well well, and, and I know Christy's album is not the only one, like you said, you've produced many other artists and that, but um, Donna, you've had your hand in, in producing and working with uh, artists uh, throughout your career as well. How is, how is that for you from going from the songwriting part to going behind the board and producing an album for others? Well, I'm, I, I certainly haven't had as much experience or opportunity as Jerry has. I'm, I'm more, um, I've only been doing it a couple of years, but I love it. So my, my uh, forte is to work with artists that are songwriters because um, my brand of production, I really work fr with the artist from the very beginning, um, looking at the songs, shoring the songs up, you know, and, and, um, and then recording. And I love it. It's, it's very fulfilling. I'm working with Valerie Smith right now on a project and a concept that is, it's just wonderful. I, I feel really blessed to be part of it. Um, and, and I don't know, I, I love it. It's, it's keeping me busy and that's a good thing because uh, in these times of COVID, I, I'm one of the blessed ones that, that have something to do right now that's in the music <laughs> business and we can do it in a safe way. Uh, right. I've been 
we've been recording differently, you know, so it doesn't just yeah. affect the live music. Um, when we go in to record now, we're layering the projects, or at least I am, uh, you know, not having as many people in the studio right now and kind are of keep Are you wearing your mask? What'd you say? Are you wearing your mask? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm wearing it. <laughs> Hey, what? That's me looking like Dole Lawson. <laughs> Have I said how much I love Dole Lawson? I hope he's watching. Well, that's your Dole Lawson. <laughs> I, I dressed up for Dole Lawson. I like Dole Lawson for Halloween for a party. Oh, I thought that was your mask. <laughs> no, that's me being chief. I call him the chief. I love him. I love him too. I love Dole Lawson. I know. I do speaking I, I, of I, speak, speaking of Doyle Lawson, of course, Donna, you've had him produce your album. Have what have you taken from the Hall of Famer himself and, that you implemented in what you do? <sighs> I don't. He's just. I love Doyle Lawson. <laughs> <laughs> I to watch him work. There's not one, and and Jerry does this too. Um, both these guys are great at it. But Doyle Lawson, there's not one element of that project that he doesn't have his hands on. Every single note, every single tone that the engineer adds, um, my vocals, he, he is just so good at sitting in that driver's seat. And I am the luckiest girl in the United States of America because uh, <laughs> it, he's pretty special to work with. I love the way he goes about deciding what songs are going to be on the album and how it's going to have this cohesive um, element that, that just knits it all together um, because I don't make it easy for him. I write a lot. And when he asks for songs, I send him like, I don't know, 20 or 30 at a time. And um, he painstakingly goes through every single one of them note by note. He'll call me and he'll say, Hey, I like this song. I think the second verse could be a little stronger. Um, he's just really hands on. He, he honestly drives the whole project and uh, never lets off the gas pedal. Never, not till the end. Well, and I actually was just going to ask both of you this because as producers and songwriters, you know, and the artists that you've worked with, you know, obviously as a producer, you guys receive the music that they would like to record um, or they go to you and say, can you help me find some material, you know, to kind of fit the the album that they're working on? Is, is that um, something, you know, that you guys are very passionate about doing so working, obviously working with the artists and, you know, making sure it all, you know, kind of flows together because you obviously want to put an album out that's going to flow but fit the artist and what you guys are trying to, um, you know, achieve in, in releasing this project with them. Jerry, we'll go with you first. Um, I apologize, Michelle. What was the actual question? <laughs> I was Who's to you. your favorite female singer? That was the question. <laughs> who's, who's your favorite female singer, Jerry? Sally. <laughs> well, Donnie, Lucy, of course. <laughs> Are you talking about <laughs> and gathering material? Correct. Okay. Because you, you don't I, just rely on the artist to do it. You guys help kind of pull it all together as producers. That, that, that's exactly right. And one of the, I, I mean, maybe I'm fooling myself, but I think one of the values, probably the greatest value to any artist to have Donna or I or people like the two of us to produce is because we're song people. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's face it, I don't care how great you are. If you don't have a great song to, to get on the radio or to, to, for people to know you by, it doesn't really matter how good you are. That's just the honest truth, because the only way you're going to make any kind of progress is to be on the radio. Yeah. And, have uh, you, Jerry, and I, I want you to continue, but I have a quick question because you brought, have you literally told an artist that ain't you? That's just not going to fly when you guys are getting ready to, to uh, go in the studio? Well, I don't know if I've used the words, that's not you, but I've, I've used the words. I can't believe you're bringing this up. Um, I, but I have, I have said to them, you know, take this song, this great song, and please make it yours. You know, make it in your and how you would do it. Uh, because I don't want somebody to think they can't do a song because they think it's not them. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't want to, I'll never make anybody do something they don't want to do. But I think I know enough about radio and, and great songs to, to know what kind of songs we need to make a great record. And I, 
And just as an aside there, Donna was talking about Doyle. Doyle Lawson is not only a legend and not only one of the greatest musicians in any genre Doyle. ever. Doyle Lawson is a song man. He is a song man. Mm -hmm. And he knows what's great and what isn't. And he absolutely is one of my favorite. I mean, I don't care whether I've got a song on the record or not, because most of the records, I don't have a song on his record. But I have been blessed to have a few cuts. And regardless of whatever album it is, you 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 can't stop listening to it because they're all great songs. He knows how to pick great songs that fit what he wants to do. So I think as a producer, my greatest uh, uh, asset or whatever you want to call it is the ability to help pick great songs. I, I mean, that's I'm, I may be fooling myself, but that's proved to be pretty, pretty accurate through the years. I thought you were going to say your asset was, you know, how great your hair always looks. <laughs> no. My greatest asset sitting in the other room over there. <laughs> yes, I know. Where is Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> so, Donna, how how is uh how is this for you? Like at, like at, you know, asking Jerry about you know how do you pretty much you know go you know full force and and helping an artist drive to the right songs for them um, as you know, not only as the songwriter, but as the producer of the, the albums. Again, I, I'm a different kind of producer. So a lot of the things like I, I've done two out, uh, two projects with Rebecca Long mm -hmm. and we actually write them together. Um, I've done a project on Ali Shoemate, who's had uh, quite a bit of radio success and we wrote together, you know, and, and sort of created this project together from the ground up. Um, I work with a wonderful artist named Danny Crabtree. He's precious. He wrote a song called Take Me Back to West Virginia for Larry Sparks. And, you know, I love to work with singer songwriters. So um, and I like to be on the, the, the beginning of it. You know, let, mm -hmm. let's we'll look at the songs that they've got partial or whole lyric on and then um, we'll just start whittling on them. That's mm -hmm. that's where I feel like my strength is as a producer. And mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of my approach. Yeah. Has, has there ever been a time when you guys were producing an artist where all of a sudden at the last minute, another song just kind of comes to the table, but the album's like, you feel it's complete, but then you got this one song fell in your lap, whether you wrote it and you're like, oh, this would fit this project so well. I could know you guys could do it. How do you guys handle that? Do you go ahead and bump a song out or you add the song to to the album, Donna? Uh, I haven't had that happen. I mean, usually I'm a real detail producer, so I'll mm -hmm. get it down to here's here's what it's going to cost by the penny. Um, here's here are the songs. We're going to get them charted and arranged before we go in the studio. So usually um, I haven't had that happen yet because we really I go in with a full on plan and it's sort of um, in concrete by the time we get to the studio. It has happened to me as an artist where oh. I'll come in and go, you know, I, I've just written something or, you know, and uh, when I was working with Keith Sewell, that happened twice. I didn't think I had the, the, the last song on the project. I didn't think I had the special one that was going to, you know, be the big ending. And twice Rick and I have, you know, sort of done the midnight homework and, and wrote a song that we loved and that I brought in the next day. So um, I've had, I've been the one to cause it, but I've never had it happen <laughs> to me as a producer. Uh, how about you, Jerry? Um, I'm trying to sit here and think of a specific instance when that's happened. Uh, I'm a lot like Donna in that I have my charts ready and I have, I kind of know how the album's going to go. So um, I kind of, I have my plan together before I get in the studio. However, um, there is no way that I would pass on a great song at the last minute. I can tell you that. Uh, and it would be a matter if we've already started cutting the record, it would be a matter of adding it. Um, and then possibly just taking a song out that we save, you know, for another album down the road, that sort of thing. Um, but, uh, I, you know, as a, as, a, as a producer, you have to take your songwriting hat off. And uh, at least I think, and I think Donna would agree with that. When I'm producing somebody, um, I'm going to pitch in my songs because I, I don't want them to hear them on the radio later and say, why didn't you pitch me that song? But at the same time, um, I have never, 
ever passed on a great song by because I I reach out to every great writer in in bluegrass and country mm -hmm. too for that matter, and um, I want the best songs for that artist. I don't care who writes them, and that's the honest truth. Um, um, I'm also grateful to have artists like Christy Cox, who we were talking about Doyle knowing great songs, and 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 Don and I having a feel for great songs. Uh, Christy. Man, you talk about somebody that knows great songs. She knows what's great for her. I remember when we were producing the Ricochet album that did really well for her. Um, I uh, And I don't know if maybe I was just kind of being backward about it because I was a writer on it. But she was like, I want Ricochet to be the first single. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, there's so many great songs on here. I don't, I, and she was like, no, Ricochet needs to be the first single. And man, she was absolutely right. It, it, it took off. It made the whole album work. And she she actually won a golden guitar on that song. So it's it's really great when you work with artists who recognize great songs for them. And it makes my job a lot easier, to be honest with you. Right. So has there been any, uh, now whether it's been with you, you as an artist in the studio recording or as a producer or even in the little uh, house uh, songwriting house there. Uh, do you have any fun stories uh, that you guys, uh, you know, could share either about each other or, you know, something that you've experienced that you'd love to share? Jerry, we'll go with you first. I've got a great story. Oh, um, no. Well, I've got a lot of great stories about the little, <laughs> but Okay, one weekend um, we had some folks there, and I was I was with uh, um, oh gosh, now I'm not gonna be able to think their last names. That's so terrible right here on TV. Let me but uh, I was with uh, Mark and Terry um, Jacobs, and Terry Jacobs, and Mark. Um, gosh, I stayed at his home. Isn't that terrible? I can't even think. Uh, lives up in Dayton. Uh, Bondurant. Man, Mark Bondurant. I knew that. I just couldn't think. Mark Bond. I've, I've written twice today. In my, in my I, love, I love Mark. Terry, Terry and Mark, I love Terry. Bondurant. Okay. So out, out at Donna's house, you know, she's got a place in her house. She's writing and I'm out there in the little house. And I'm with Mark and Terry. Well, the other couple that was there that weekend were uh, vegans. They were vegetarians or vegans. And so we keep all the food for the dinner out in a great big freezer refrigerator that, that they have out in the little house. And uh, we were working on a song that we were, we'd were we started. And Rick walks out into the little house to get food out of the freezer to get ready to start, to start cooking. And he said, well, he said, we've got a couple of vegetarians here. And uh, so, you know, they didn't want any meat at all. And I don't know how good these beans are going to be, but I think they're going to be okay. But they didn't want any meat in these beans. And Terry Jacobs just, out of her mouth comes, well, you got to have some bacon in your beans. And the minute she said it, I was like, what did you just say? She said, well, you got to have some bacon in your beans. And I said, that's what we're going to write. We're going to write that right now. And I'm telling y'all, that was one of the, Mark Bondurant got onto it and she did too. We all got into it so fast and so quick. And we probably wrote 30 it, minutes. We probably wrote it in 30, probably the fastest song I ever wrote. Yeah. And that's the truth. And, and it went on to be recorded by Joe and it was a big hit for him. And I, I love performing it in my shows, in my songwriter shows. It's a great moment in the show to just get a few laughs and have fun. And uh -huh. so um, hey, that's one of my favorite stories from the little house. Oh, that a good one? yeah, it is. I don't, I don't have a particular funny story except that it's Jerry and well, Rick is sort of like the straight guy and Jerry and I are like brother and sister. So we start the workshops off uh, for the first three hours is the time that we'll do a little honest to goodness teaching where we're actually sort of lecturing and then we'll critique um, some songs. And my favorite thing is to throw Jerry under the bus <laughs> at some point during that part is to somehow throw Jerry, <laughs> like, you know, if, it, if it's a song that I don't know how to start off by critiquing, I'll just look at Jerry and go, you go ahead and start, Jerry. <laughs> and so, I don't know, we have a good time. And by the end of the, by the end of that three hours, the folks attending kind of know us a little by then. I don't know. We're just, we just have a good time. I don't, I think if you can't laugh and have a good time, and it gets too serious. I, I think the songs will be just yeah. a little stiff, you know. So so we're just us. Yeah, at the, we are always tell, us. I will tell you, and she throws me under the bus a lot, by the way. A lot. But uh, <laughs> when when we start that thing out, Michelle, you 
you should see some of these people's faces because they don't know how to take it. They don't know that she's, I mean, I love her like a sister and I'd, I'd die for her. I mean, mm -hmm. we're very close, but I also know her personality. Am I your favorite singer? My all time favorite singer. <laughs> and, uh, and I know if I don't say that, she'll throw me under the bus on this show. So, <laughs> <laughs> but my point is these people are, you know, they just met us and a few minutes we had a, you know, they had a biscuit with us and, and a coffee, you know? And so we'll be sitting there and boy, she'll, she'll say something or do something me in their face. Like, I can't believe she said that to him or they don't. Anyway, they finally figure it all out by the end of the day that we're yeah. with each other and that we love each other, but it's, it's, it's my pretty favorite funny. part. Huh? It's my favorite part. <laughs> my favorite part is watching their faces because, man, some of them don't know what the, they're like. Whoa, what the? <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have been part of the industry, like I said, for years. And technology has changed in the years as well. Jerry, your hair looks great. <laughs> no, I mean, it's great. I've been, you said I've been here a long time. I'm proof. I can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> I call her mine. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you guys felt with the uh, increased technology change in the world as a songwriter and a producer, as well as an artist um, for you? How have you, you know, obviously you've embraced it, but do you still find it sometimes challenging um, as things change, Jerry? Oh man, I I'm just going to be honest with you as a, as a songwriter, it's destroyed us as songwriters. Um, when I came to Nashville, there were 2,000 um, what we call pure songwriters. They weren't artists at all who had little publishing deals up and down Music Row and were getting a salary, getting what we call a draw in order to, to make a living writing songs. Yeah. There are less than 200 now. And uh, when you, I mean, there's more songwriters in town when you add in the artist writers who have a record deal. Uh -huh. um, but um, that's huge. And uh, all of that was due to the fact that this technology came along. I mean, why would you buy a record if you can listen to it free anytime you want to? Um, so it, it, it really, it, from a songwriting standpoint, it's totally destroyed our royalties. Now, as a record label guy running a record label, I, I do embrace it. I have no choice. And I do think that is the future. The key, and it's going to take a while. I hope I live long enough to see it. But the key is getting the laws changed and updated on a regular basis to where you can actually make a living from your songs being played on the Internet, and from Spotify and Apple and Pandora and all that. Um, when you, uh, you know, I saw Vince talk one time. Vince Gill was talking about how, you know, when we were kids, when I was in the 70s, when I was a kid, I could go buy an, a, a 45 RPM for 99 cents. You know, mm -hmm. today my song is only worth 99 cents on, on you know, on a download for iTunes. So, right. um, and, and, and there's a lot of different people to get a piece of that. So, um, isn't it amazing that 40 years later, almost 50 years later, um, that, that it's not worth any more money than that. I mean, it's just kind of, it's, 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 it's disappointing and it's, it's discouraging, but at the same time, if you want to stay in the business and you want to play ball, you've got to embrace technology. You have to learn how to use it to your benefit. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do. It's, it's, we're trying, we're nav I'm navigating that personally in my career as an artist, my career as a writer, my career as a, as a label executive. Um, and it's 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 difficult to navigate sometimes to try to figure out who's this really benefiting, you know? Right. And because of these these companies, their product is our music. They wouldn't exist without music. That's mm -hmm. the bottom line. And to, to 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 be able to take advantage of somebody's art and somebody's uh, creativity, um, I don't know. You shouldn't have gotten me started on this, but. <laughs> I, I, That's honestly, what this is, Jerry. It's yeah, real talk. I, I, know, I know. But I, I mean, I, there, there are two sides to the equation, and I really do understand both. And I'm trying to live in both worlds. If that makes sense. Right. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead, Donna. <laughs> I'm sorry. What I was going to say is, I have a little different uh, view of it. First of all, I didn't start having my real success until things were already changed. So, um, unfortunately, Jerry has more of a reference of how it was and mm -hmm. how it is. And 
you know, me, I just feel blessed that, you know, for the first time in our lives, we're making a living doing what I love and what I work so hard doing. And uh, so I feel blessed in that. The other thing um, in the bluegrass world, you know, they still want to buy that CD. They, they want to come to my shows and they want to stand in line and they want to give me That's their true. money. They want to put it in my hand. And that's such a blessing. So, you know, from a, an artist songwriter par, uh, viewpoint, you know, I'm, I don't have the same history that Jerry has, mm -hmm. but the one thing that I was going to say, that's a positive, just like with the COVID thing for every lost opportunity, there's a gained opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the new technology where like the iPads and the uh, computers are, are, it's made me a better writer. Um, because my thoughts, I'm, I'm a really fast writer and I can't hand write what's in my head as fast as I can type it or to speak it into my phone. Right. So it, um, I tell the, the, the new songwriters all the time, you know, learn to use it. It's made me a better writer. So, um, there, there is, there, there are drawbacks and, and there are benefits and uh, Jerry's right. You just have to learn how to adapt and, and make the things work for you. And, um, and hopefully he's right. You know, hopefully they'll, they'll change the laws and you know, it, it is sad that in the whole scheme of things, and this isn't me being on a soapbox, but this is me being on a soapbox. Um, <laughs> it doesn't start with a song. It starts with a songwriter and, um, no one can have this career without people like me and Jerry and Rick. They can't. It starts right here mm -hmm. and we write it and somebody records it. And we are the ones that get the least of the pie. We are, we get the least amount of, of the pie okay. and we are the most important element, the most bar none. Yeah. And oh yeah, they're, Definitely. they're upset. It. <laughs> A song Amen. doesn't start until the songwriter writes it so right. <laughs> um right. you know i know we have a few songwriters that are um watching and i uh, want to give a shout out to david stewart and barney rogers of course barney oh, um wow. just took home an ibma award uh with yeah. alan bybee um yeah. and then evan dickerson it kind of has a, a question what's come um good advice to share with upcoming songwriters who really truly want to just write songs um you know for a living donna we'll go with you first I say um, to, and I tell this to the songwriters that attend the, the workshops, and this is not me making a sales pitch. I promise you it's not. Your it's dollars okay. and your efforts are well spent when you try to become the best writer you can be. It, someone told me when I first started writing, and this has been years ago, uh, and it was a, a dear friend of mine, Carrie Chater, you know, you're, you are as good as the writer sitting in the room with you. So, so strive to, to write with writers better than you, because yeah. it's going to make you a better writer. Yeah, totally. And um, if, if that means coming, you know, to the workshops and learning from people that, you know, are, are maybe ahead in the game, my advice to any songwriters wanting to do this for a living, spend the time and become the and become the best, become undeniable, and you will have success. Yeah, yeah. Um, shout out, by the way, to David Stewart, who wrote Two Wet to Plow for Carolina Blue on Billy Blue Records. Yeah, um, yeah. And also, uh, shout out to Evan. He's a good He's a good boy. Um, wh what was specifically was the question? I'm sorry. Um, what advice can you share for upcoming songwriters who are trying to write songs for a living? Well, and who's your favorite girl singer? <laughs> Um, Donna hit the nail on the head. I mean, the, the key is when I came to Nashville, um, I mean, I feel like God had given me a talent, but I, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I knew how to rhyme words and I knew what a, a verse was and a chorus was, but the greatest opportunity that I ever got was when I got here and, and started meeting people and got a publishing deal. And my publisher started putting me with great writers who would mentor me and teach me and, 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 and teach me, you know, you can know all the structure in the world and how to rhyme words, but it, you know, right here, there, there's, there's a part of the heart. If you don't have that, um, you, it's just not going to happen. And I, and I'm, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly, but you've got to have this 
heart for it. And you have to be willing to dig and to listen, listen to songs and try to figure out why your favorite songs are your favorite songs. Do they make you feel something? Do they, and if they do make you feel something, why do they make you feel something? You know, so um, the best advice, like Donna said, I think is to, you want an opportunity and you're not always going to get one. It's not like it was in Nashville. Like when I moved here, when I moved here, it was easier to get with people. It's just not, everything's kind of closed as far as the circles go uh, in, especially in the country world. But um, if you get an opportunity, you want to write with a writer better than you. That's the only way you can learn. Um, when I started getting in rooms with great songwriters that had had success, I'm not kidding y'all. I would come up with lines and thoughts that I don't, I'm like, where did that come from? But it makes you a better, per, a better writer. And it makes you dig deeper when you're with someone better than you. And that, that is the best advice I could give anybody. Yeah. I, and with the fact that you guys have been um, writing for so long and your careers have, uh, you know, just skyrocketed throughout the years um, and that you have also have had times where you had failed, um, failure, you know, failure has happened in your career. How, how have you and how can you encourage others who feel like they failed to overcome that failure. Jerry, we'll go with you first. Say that again, Michelle. I'm sorry. I'm How do you uh, recover after a failure, a failure attempt oh. at achieving your goals? You oh. know, you, you've been well, in the business since 82. Yeah, and yeah. <clears throat> Here's the deal with songwriting. And, and even as an artist, if you are blessed enough to do it for a long time, your career, you know, it does this. You're going to go up and down. You're going to go up and down. Nobody's career just does that all the time and never stops. Mm -hmm. And so it is difficult. And if you, if you are unable to accept rejection, you don't want to be a songwriter. I can tell you that. Um, you know, I've been blessed to have over 500 different songs recorded. Well, I've written a thousand, you know, and I can't count the times that I've had a song recorded that then that, I mean, I've had a Reba cut that she recorded that never made an album. How disappointing is that? How, how heartbreaking is that to, actually get it recorded and then not make that record. I mean, I've been on a few of her records, but I've had songs recorded by her that didn't make a record. Uh, we've all had songs that have been recorded by multiple artists that never have been heard because they never were released for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, the only way, you know, what's it, I, don't, I don't know how you come back from it, but I know that I've learned to accept it. And that just, that's just how it is. I can't, all I can do is write the greatest song that I can and try to get it to the person that I think needs to record it. Beyond that, it's totally out of my control. It really is. And so you just have to be able to let things go sometimes and, and understand that uh, for every disappointment and every valley you go into, uh, go into, if you keep doing it, don't quit. Keep at it. Believe in what you're doing. You will start, you'll go back up the mountain at some point. And, and it's the mountaintop moments that I keep in mind because, again, when you're, when you, I, I'm 60 years old. I've been blessed over the years, man, to be able to, and I still am excited about it. I still love to write. A, I, I had two writing appointments today and I, I, and I enjoyed both of them and got two really strong songs. And so the passion, you have to have that passion. you got to want to do it. And uh, uh, that, 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 that looking forward to that next great song helps me get over whatever didn't happen yesterday. If that makes any sense. Yeah. How about you, Donna? Well, um, I immediately in my head when you were talking about that question went to my Atlantic record days. Mm -hmm. So imagine this, mm -hmm. because Jerry knows how coveted those great big country deals are. Um, you, they just don't happen very often. And I had a major record deal on Atlantic Records. I was out in L.A. doing a Dick Clark show and I got the call that I had been dropped. And it took me, I, I'll never forget the lowest moment was when honestly Rick picked me up off the ground. I probably about four or five months after that, I, I, I had reached an all time low thinking, you know, I let that loss define who I was as a person there for a little while. And what I would tell anyone um, trying to get into this business, you can't give up on that. You can't let the losses define what you are. You know what you are. You know, you know what you are as a singer. You know where your heart is in the music business. 
And if you've got that, what Jerry's talking about, if you've got that passion and that drive to want to succeed in this business, don't give up. Just never, never give up. And um, I didn't after I, I recovered. Uh, that was the time, you know, I had always done music, always. My, when, when I was a little girl, my dad just loved to hear me sing. So he bought a bar not a bar, a, a restaurant that had a bar side to it and, and they had a band and he, he bought it so that I would have somewhere to sing on the weekend. And um, I never knew, I never knew a moment when I didn't think that I was going to be doing this where I'm sitting right now talking to you, talking about music and talking about doing this for a lifetime. I always knew this was what I was going to do. There was that six month period after I lost the, the Atlantic mm -hmm. deal that I floundered. And I got my first, what I call like real job. I went and I worked in a chick jean outlet for two weeks. They said I could stock the jeans. And I was just like, I am never doing music again. And I'm folding jeans and folding jeans and put them on racks. And I thought, this is great. It's sort of like <laughs> mindless work. I'm going to get paid for it. I don't have to worry about myself anymore. I can do this. And I get a call from a guy named Ray Pennington. <laughs> and um uh, when I got home, Rick said, hey, this uh, Ray Pennington just called you. He said he's got some work for you. I said, I don't even want to hear about it. I'm not in the music business anymore. And so he said, Ma, you might ought to call him back. So I called him back and he said, Donna, um, I got this account to do uh, all the guide vocals for this karaoke account. I said, it'll be 600 songs and I'll pay you per song and the backgrounds. So I said, oh, gosh, Rick, I got to go in there and give those people my notice. <laughs> That's a changing factory. <laughs> I did promptly in the morning. I was like, gosh, I hate to tell you this. It was real fun for two weeks, but I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> and but it's it is like that. It's the ebb and it's the roller coaster ride of music business. And you know, and I I, I went back and I did that that uh, whole string of songs. It took me uh like eight months to get through that whole thing. And at the end of it, it just taught me one thing is like if you love music, it is as much a part of you as breathing. You mm -hmm. can't give it up. You can't walk away from it. It's yeah. if, if you've got that kind of passion. Yeah. And right. I thank God every day that I hung in there and that, that I'm here now because it, I love it. I live and breathe it. Jerry talked about getting excited today because he wrote two songs. I was excited today just thinking about this new thing I'm working on. And it's just, that's where we live now. That's, yeah. Yeah. that's what I do. Um, it's always refreshing. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah. Well, I just want to say, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, my first publishing deal here in Nashville um, uh, was $200 a month. And the guy that signed me to the publishing deal um, talked me into quitting my job at Opryland USA which, as a performer out there to write songs full time for $200 a month. And uh, um, he talked about eating a lot of macaroni and cheese back in the days. I mean, that was when they were 15 cents a box. And so there's a lot of sacrifice that came along with that. And the, the really sad part was, that's true. The really sad part was. That's why his cholesterol screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> I have great cholesterol. By the way. Um, <laughs> but um, the really sad part was I ended up in a lawsuit with this guy, this publisher. He really. He really tried to screw me over and I didn't, you know, I didn't have an attorney look over my contract. He told me the same guy that was his attorney wrote the contract and I trusted this guy. Matter of fact, this guy became my father figure in Nashville. And so when, when we came to heads and came to blows and I actually had to sue him and he's the only guy I've ever sued in the music business after all these years, I was in my twenties and, um, I was in this bad spot. You know, I, I, I thought I'm, I wasn't going to bring this up, but Donna was talking about her record deal loss. And I mean, first of all, to think somebody that was your true friend and a father kind of person to you and uh, could do something like this was just absolutely devastating to me. And, um, but it made me, gosh, it made me so much stronger. Uh, I remember I getting a call from this guy's wife. The guy was writing for his wife one night and she said, you know, if you go through with this lawsuit, you'll never, you will never write in this town, this town again, ever. You will, your career is over. And I remember having the guts on that phone call to say to her, my career is not ever going to start till I get you people out of my life. Woo. And um, 
when I hung up that phone, I thought, you know what? I'm going to show them. I am going to. It gave me more drive and ambition and more passion to be successful than I, I than I had originally, you know, because I was like Donna. I did music as a kid. I, I always knew. I always felt like God wanted me to come to Nashville and, and do music. I was a fan of this stuff as right. well as wanting to be a participant. And I'll never forget uh, the first time I was ever uh, invited to the Grand Ole Opry stage as, as Porter Wagner's uh, guest. My mom and dad came down from Ohio and I'll never forget who I'll never forget standing in the backyard of my house. And my dad was there. Who? Sorry. And I said, dad, I'm going to do this. My dad for the first time in his life said, son, I believe you. I believe you're going to do this. And, uh, God's blessed me ever since then. I love you, Jerry, Sally. Yeah. Love you. It's, you know, the best thing to ever hear is from the parents saying that, that you could do it. Yeah. Yep. That's for he sure. Never, he just never, he just never made it, but he never said it with his voice before then. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wait, that's, an, that's another thing we have in common, Jerry, is I always had supportive parents, you yeah. know, just, oh, okay. oh, my mom. I don't know, I don't know what, what I, I would have done without the championship of my father and my husband. I mean, at the lowest points in my life, they were just like that. You can do this. You get mm -hmm. up, do it again. Yeah. So going, kind of going back to you, um, pitching the songs to the songwriters, Marsha wanted to know, obviously, how do you uh, choose the right singer for the song? Is it, do you, or do you have a publisher that kind of gears it to the person that you'd like to pitch the song to a certain artist? Well, Anna? Or Jerry, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say uh, when I, you know, I'm writing for myself now these days and keep my own publishing. But back in the day when I had a publisher, we would we would both have, you know, that was kind of a mutual agreement. We would both discuss who we thought would be best, especially if we were, you know, if we're pitching the song to a particular artist. Um, there were um, particular, um, you know, singers in, at, at that point in time. And Donna was one of them for a long time who sang a lot of demos in Nashville and we would pick the artist that we thought could sell the song or we would pick the demo singer, excuse me, that we felt would best uh, sell the song for the artist we were pitching to, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. We yeah. did the same thing. I've got a funny little story to that. So, um, you know, I, I write a lot and I had gotten way behind on, on demos and um, I have a, a partner uh, now we bought the, we bought our publishing company together. And so her name is Kathy Anderson and she's the most wonderful person. She works a little bit as my manager, a little bit as my publisher and uh, certainly my dearest friend. So anyway, we had, uh, we said, you know, we, we need to go in and we need to uh, cut 20 songs. That's a lot. And um, I, so I get the songs together. I hire the excellent Brian Sutton. And uh, Rebecca Long was at the helm. She was she was the one uh, rec uh, the recording engineer for me. And I made the incredible choice. I had to beg Jerry because he doesn't do these anymore, but he did them for me. I said, could you come and and uh, sing some demos for me? He said, oh, yeah. You know, so we had a good actually had a good time. And, and uh, he recorded. I'm, I'm bragging a little bit on your brother. Um, <laughs> out of the 20 songs, I have had 18 of them cut. And I always say that Jerry was my lucky charm. I mean, he he just sings the poop out of them. <laughs> and, uh, and really, he made them his own. And uh, one of them is Wilma Walker. One of them was I Am a Drifter. And uh, mm -hmm. these are just, um, you know, the stamp of somebody who knows how to deliver someone else's song and not get in the way of it. So when you're a demo singer for this person asking this question, what you want, you don't, you don't want... Um, I, I, I don't want to say a generic voice because that's not what you want at all. You want a singer that can interpret the song, but not get in the way of someone else's imagination if you're going to pitch the song. So mm -hmm. an, in other words, an artist has to listen to that song and hear themselves um, able to sing the song. That's right. Uh, right. I don't know. Did I say that right, Jerry? Yes. You just, yeah. So, you know, because I was a hired gun for many, many years and Jerry, obviously, too. Uh, we did this for a living for other songwriters. You want to interpret. You just don't want to add too much of your, uh, 
your artistry. You you just really you're there to represent the song, yeah. and uh, nobody did it as well as Jerry Sally for those songs. I'm telling you. Well, I know um, I want to recap, uh, just remind folks, obviously, during this pandemic, the uh, Little House Songwriter uh, Workshop hasn't been, you know, uh, open. And hopefully you guys will have some dates coming in 2021 um, and that and kind of getting people back into the Little House and creating some more music. Um, and that um, I know, obviously, doing something like that virtually it's kind of harder because the fact that it, it kind of has a whole nice warm um welcoming feel when you're there in person on the yeah. farm to do something like that so uh, i want to make sure people you know consider um you know checking that out when it's back up and open to accept folks to come to the the house there and and participate in the little house uh, songwriting workshops because I, I've never heard nothing that is nothing that's come out of there has never been anything disappointing. It's always been great music oh, um, that has either been, you know, sent to me if it's been released or not released or on an album, it's always good stuff. And um, of course, um, Doyle Lawson uh, produced Donna Luisi's uh, album off of Billy Blue Records. Um, this is a phenomenal album as well. Um, this has tracks and cuts, uh, Time for Life is, you know, a, a wonderful uh, title for what it's all about. And of course, uh, you've co-wrote one with Jerry on this album. And uh, just uh, it's definitely one of 12 albums that you have released and um, just remarkable music that you've continuously put out um, as a, a, a singer, as well as a songwriter. And uh, then, of course, we got Jerry Sally's latest album, um, Bridges and Backroads, and kind of going back home, kind of going back to the day um, for some songs that you've written in the bat in the past, and teamed up with some amazing, great songwriters on this as well. Uh, I will honestly, you know, let me be the bridge, Jerry. Me, you've talked about this title to cut track. You know, it's kind of been when I first heard it. It definitely did not end up being what I thought the song was going to be about, which is definitely amazing. Um, and, you know, I definitely it, the, the catchy. I miss my Mississippi, my miss, my Mississippi and Mississippi. I, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is the best catchiest song um, on this album as well. Um, so folks definitely need to check out Jerry Sally dot com. Donna Luisi dot com. Um, again, cannot thank you guys. Uh, enough for being part of the, the evening and making this a fun night um, kind of getting into a little bit of producing songwriting and of course working with amazing artists as well as working and doing your own music um, and sharing your views um, with everybody that's joined us tonight and you know it makes it makes a little fun getting a little more real especially when we're talking real bluegrass and you guys definitely continue to keep that eternal flame going strong with your producing and your songwriting. And we know more hits are to come um, out of you as performers, as well as producers and songwriters. And uh, we just truly appreciate what you've done again. Congratulations on your numerous awards that you've all received um, as songwriters. There is a reason why we uh, all look up to what you do, not only as a, a fan um, or a radio host, uh, but also someone who appreciates great written music and you two are at the helms of it and it will continue on. So thank you so much. Well, thank, thank, thank you, you Michelle. I, you know, Donna was talking about how it starts and it does, it starts with a songwriter mm -hmm. and it starts with that songwriter and their song, but we can't do what we do without artists to record our songs yeah. and radio folks to to play our music. I mean, it's really that simple. And you know how much Aaron and I love you. We've known you for years now. We just love you so much as a person, but we appreciate you so much as a DJ and you are so important to our industry. I mean, I mean, IBMA broadcaster of the year. Come on, baby. And, uh, <laughs> we just want you to know how much we appreciate and love you and, uh, and appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and to be with, to be with my big sis, uh, Donna there. It just means a lot to me. So thanks. Oh, it's been wonderful. I've enjoyed it. Oh, it's always a blast to bring everybody back to real talk and get away from uh, the hectic world that we're living in right now. And I know we are going to push forward and more great bluegrass music and music is just going to keep us going and strong. And, 
and we appreciate you um, again from the two of you for making it make it happen. Uh, again, Real Talk with Donna Ulisi, two-time IBMA award winner. Jerry Sally, two-time IBMA, IBMA award winner. Just remarkable uh, to see you guys continue to grow and looking forward to hearing more new releases uh, with you guys behind the board as well as in front as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Michelle. Thanks everybody for joining Real Talk Bluegrass. Another fun evening again with our two IBMA Songwriter of the Year award winners. It is Real Talk. We got real with Jerry Sally, Donna Ulisi. You guys all have yourself a wonderful night. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Stay safe and be well. Until next time, it's Real Talk Bluegrass. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>